Our last speaker for today, where is he? Uh, Ofer Tsur from the Gornitsky Law Firm. Ofer, please. My name is uh, Ofer Tsur. I'm a senior partner and the head of the litigation department at Gornitsky Law Firm in Israel. Uh, thank you, Zor, for inviting me here today, trying to brush up my English. And thank you all for being here, dear colleagues, professors, honorable judges. My distinguished colleagues to this panel have shared some interesting and enlightening thoughts regarding the implementation of the law of the promotion and competition. <laughs> now I don't see and competition and reduction of uh, concentration, which I will refer to as the concentration law. And I'd like to add a few thoughts regarding some aspects of the law myself. The concentration law, as you might have heard, is an innovative creation, an Israeli creation. From Zion, the Torah shall go forth, as mentioned in the Bible in free translation. It is unique. There are no other like it in the world. Therefore, its implementation and legal questions it raises and will rise in the future have yet to be discussed upon. I will be addressing some of the questions of the, that the law raises today. On the three central chapters of the concentration law, I will be focusing on a very significant one, at least as far as the complexity of the implementation goes, the chapter which deals with the concentration on multi-tiered pyramid corporate structures. Since I have relatively little time at my disposal, I will not give a full outline of the law provisions regarding pyramid corporate structure, but I will briefly outline the three fundamentals within the law on that aspects. The first one is a categorical and absolute determination in the law according to which, and I quote, a second-tiered company shall not have control over another multi-tier company. This practically means that the holding of a pyramid in which there are more than two publicly traded companies is forbidden. The second one is a transitional provision which, complete, which compels the folding of the pyramid tiers to a three-layered structure within four years, as you have heard, and the two-layered structure within six years, commencing from the public, publication of the law that was December uh, 2013. And the third one, a sanction imposed for the holding of a multi-tier pyramid company against the law, which will be the uh, appointment of a trustee for the sale of the controlling interest in the third company. And we will talk about complications and somewhat solutions uh, to the dilemmas that everything, uh, that the question, about the question that are being raised. I believe that the combination of the two legal matters, i.e. one, the concentration law regarding the folding of the pyramids alongside with two, the general corporation law rules including in inter alia fiduciary duties of corporate officers, the duty to act in the best interest of the company, conflict of interest of controlling shareholders and officers, distribution of dividends of the company, the company fair's value, etc., is expected to raise a range of question and disagreement. There is certainly a non-concrete legal area formed by this combination which the Israeli court, particularly the financial division, will be ex expected to concretize, concretize. In our short time together, I would like to give a few examples for such complex questions that could arise, which, to my assessment, will have to be sorted out by the court, unless some, sometimes somewhere somebody will manage to brought an amendment to bring an amendment to the law forward the first interesting aspects to be discussed is related to the question of the ter territorial application of the concentration law 
The law prohibits the existence of a triple and above tiered company pyramid. By a tiered company, the law means a company or a foreign company which are reporting cooperation in accordance with the Israeli securities law. The concentration law does not literally apply on a foreign company or companies traded in foreign stock exchange arenas that are not reporting cooperation in Israel. Is there a lacuna in the law which will allow this, uh, which we, I'm sorry, which will allow for scheme for the exclusion of cooperation from the Israeli concentration, concentration law? Will such pyramids, pyramids be allowed? Will it be possible to avoid the low sanctions and the low bans for pyramid? For instance, in the simpler case of their formation by raising funds or debt and public offering of securities outside of Israel, or in a more complex cases existing pyramids by an attempt to transfer some Israeli publicly traded companies abroad, for example, perhaps by offering securities of a new company overseas, which would subsequently merge in a publicly traded Israeli corporation, or maybe in a way of reverse merger or other. Example that uh, we can give that has already been discussed here and also in Israeli media, uh, two cases. One of them that was mentioned as a public, publicly traded corporation called Willy Food that is controlled by an individual named Granovsky through a chain of foreign public corporations. It was further published that the concentration law creates an incentive for public companies such as Shikun Ubinui, Maya talked about it, to raise funds overseas. These are two examples that we can talk about that all already uh, are in the news. I should mention, mention that since the transitional period set within the law have yet to pass, we are still on an early stage but it is not far-fetched that such questions and claims as to foreign pyramids will awake, for example, in derivative actions by minority shareholders, and the court will have to rule on such matters. Another interesting matter in connection with the transitional provision of the concentration law is who will be a pyramid-structured corporation that will be sheltered by its concessions giving in the transitional provision for six or four years. Please note that the transitional provision in the concentration law determined that a second tier company in a pyramid is entitled to keep its controlling interest in another multi-layered company for six more years since the date of publication of the law. If it had a controlling interest in it, in the company, before the publication of the law. The controlling interest on the day of publication of the law is therefore the instigator of the transitional provision. Just imagine, for example, the following situation. A second tiered company has signed an agreement for the acquisition of a controlling interest in a third tier company before the publication of the law. The acquisition agreement contains, for instance, a condition precedent, e.g. the approval of the antitrust commissioner for the acquisition, which was only met after the publication of the law. Was the second tier company in control of the third tier company at the day of publication of the law? On the one hand, an agreement subject to a condition precedent is an entire agreement with legal implications even though the obligation set forth therein is not yet met. It follows, it follows that an agreement with legal implication for the acquisition of the controlling interest equals holding the controlling interest. At what day? Before the publication or after the publication? Maybe when the controlling, when, maybe when the condition precedent is met, we go back in time to the time the agreement was signed and we have a controlling interest at that time. On the other hand, as long as the condition precedent was not yet met, on my example, the approval of the antitrust commissioner was not given yet and the agreement is still pending. 
So maybe what I said before is wrong. And it is not certain whether the, whether the controlling interest was there already or not. This is not a small issue. If on my example there was no controlling in the interest on the day of the publication of the law, the second tier company is already in breach of the law and is subject to its sanctions, which we will discuss promptly. What is the right legal answer? Time will tell, judges will tell, class actions and derivative actions will tell. So far, we've laid down two examples in which a group of companies held in a pyramid structure may be attacked from the outside by those who claim they do not conform with the law instructions, but conf conflict may arise from the inside as well. For example, a certain situation, in certain situation, a substantial legal tension may grow between a, the third company to be folded let's call it the third tiered company, and the tiered company which, uh, which it will be folded into. Let's call it the second tiered company. Firstly, the concentration law does not specify who of the above mentioned companies should be the one bearing the legal obligation to fold and dismantle the layers. Will it be the third tier company or the second tier company? Intuitively, we might think that this obligation should be imposed on the second-tiered company alone, since it is the holder of the controlling interest and the concentration law states a second-tier company shall not have a control over another multi-tier company. Therefore, the obligation is imposed upon the second-tiered company, which should not control the third-tier company. But is it really the case? What is the third, the third company role in the story of folding? Supposedly, all matters are to be handled above it, above the second tier company. However, the concentration law chooses to involve the third tier company, even significantly involve it in the process of its own demise. For example, the concentration law allows for certain concessions in the arrangement for the sale of a third-tier company, the folded company, in accordance with Article 350 to the company's law, which is an arrangement between a company, its shareholders, and its debtors. In such an arrangement, under 350, Article 350 of the company's law, it suffices if 75% out of the one who are attending the assembly and voting will raise their hand in favor of the sale, 75%. One of the condition, uh, and, and one of the condition in the concentration law refers to a concession in it and getting 50% and above is enough. But it also demands receiving an opinion from the board of directors of the third tier company as for the fair value of the deal at hand. Please note, we are asking under the law for the board of directors of the third tier company. No, it can't be. I'm sorry. I'm, no, no, no. <laughs> no, there's, there's, there are judges here. I can ask for a decree that I have 10 more minutes, right? Um, Anyways, we are asking, the law is asking the board of directors of the third tier company to give their honest and fair opinion about a selling of the interest which is above their hand. You confuse me. Now I have 15 minutes. <laughs> so as I mentioned before, Real quick, on the one hand, it is sufficient to achieve 51% majority. There's no need to get 75% majority above. But on the other hand, the board of directors of the company being sold or folded will give fairness uh, opinion. Since I don't have much time, I will not address the issue of uh, somewhat conflict between uh, the language of three, Article 350 
of the um, company's law and the concentration uh, uh, law, which talks about 50% not in the vote, but uh, holding uh, of the shares. What is also interesting that is this provision required, the board's opinion is similar, but not yet identical to Article 329 of the company's law. Section 329 determines that in case of a special tender offer, which will result in a person or entity becoming a controlling interest of the becoming of a controlling interest, the board of directors of the company whose shares are bought will give its fairness opinion, or in case of the board decides to refrain from giving such an opinion, it will have to provide a reason. Anyways, the most important consequence of the above mentioned is that suddenly the third third company becomes a major player in the folding process. We also expect to see conflicts between the third tier company and the second tier company as far as the folding process goes. Imagine, for example, that the board of directors of the second tier company comes up with an agreement for the sale of the subsidiary, the third tier company. But the board of the directors of the third tier company, which is considered of the majority of independent directors, determines that this agreement is unfair. We are presented with a major conflict. The board of the second tier company wants to sell, and the board of the third tier company view this selling as unfair. Who will be authorized to make the decision in that case? Which of the company's best interests should be on the upper hand? On the one hand, the controlling interest over a third tier company is an asset of the controller, but on the other hand, the board of the third tier company believes that this deal is unfair who will prevail, what about directors who serve both in the board uh, of the uh, second tier company and the third tier company, will the vote count? Time and judges will tell. Wait. <laughs> Another interesting question will be the scope of responsibility imposed upon the board of directors of the third tier company while it gives its opinion as far as the fairness of the deal in accordance with the law. Can we sanction against them? Please note that under Article 330 of the company's law, there is a special sanction that can may, may be imposed upon a board member or an officer that is trying to hinder uh, the sale of the, uh, of the shares. Will such a sanction can be imposed on a board member in, this, in the third tier company that is hindering the sale under the concentration law, time will tell. How will, be, how will be the question of the fairness of the value of the shares be addressed? Is it going to be by viewing the value of the share themselves, the equity of the company by a DCF, let me remind you that the, wait, the company's law was enacted in 2000 and only in 2012, 12 years after, the Supreme Court in the judgment of Kital had ordered that the DCF is the main method to evaluate the value of a company. 12 years. Now we have the concentr concentration law. How long will it take until we find out what is fair and what is uh, good value? Last, last? last issue is the issue of the trustee. Suddenly we have a new actor in town, a new ball game that is going to be played by a trustee. We do not really know how the trustee is going to play along the trustee is going to hold the shares if the company has not been sold. He can vote by the shares. He can revoke deals that has not been completed yet. He can also revoke distribution of dividend that has been done before his time. This, these are unprecedented uh, um, powers. 
even a liquidator of a company does not have such powers, what will be the exposure of the trustee? He's going to hold the interest, the controlling interest, for four years. That's a long candidacy. And last, maybe least, is this issue. Sometimes, under the law, if a court does not seem fit or inappropriate to appoint a trustee, then the controlling shareholders of the, con of the controlling um, uh, party uh, will go to sleep, as we say. If such a case arises and a trustee is not appointed, then the second person who holds the most shares in the company is becoming a controlling party, a controlling shareholders in the company. If this is the case, a second, a second person in the company holding the largest chunk of shares in the company will probably want to avoid and to uh, be hostile to a position where a trustee will be appointed to the company. And we will see battles over there for sure. Thank you for listening.